The other day at the dog park, I overheard some people, well, some guys actually, wondering why so many women are coming forward now with stories of sexual assault 20, 30, or, or even 40 years after the fact. I'll tell you why. In 1968, I was going to see Becky, my best friend from high school. We were both 21 in our senior year in college, she in Alabama and me in California. She was spending Christmas break with her folks and invited me to visit for a couple of days. It seemed simple enough, get from my UC Berkeley campus in Northern California to her parents' home in Riverside in Southern California, maybe 450 miles, not far, a one-day drive at most, or so I thought. Except that I didn't drive. See, I grew up in Europe, took public transportation, and anyway, I didn't even have the money for a car. Becky promised that if I could get there, then she'd buy me a ticket back. So I agreed. So I turned to the 1968 version of the internet, the laundromat bulletin board. <laughs> Just off Telegraph Avenue, it was a hub of social communication. Two by three index cards, thumbtacked to the spongy cork surface, announced items for sale or trade, typing services, free kittens, and transportation. Long before the days of Uber or Lyft, drivers offered rides and riders sought drivers. Contact was made through a landline phone or a handwritten letter. A guy named Paul was offering a ride from Berkeley to LA around the date I wanted to travel. I could afford the price of a Greyhound bus ticket from LA to Riverside, so I phoned Paul and we met at a local coffee shop to finalize the details. He was a young guy, small, soft-spoken, well, we didn't have a lot in common. I was a college student. He worked a blue-collar job. He was a regular Joe, and he didn't seem at all threatening. We agreed Paul would pick me up Saturday morning, and I would chip in for gas. Maybe because I didn't drive, I didn't ask all the right questions. First, Paul pulled up in his Ford pickup truck about 1950, paint worn down to the primer, it had an AM radio, hand crank windows, a busted heater, and no seat belt. I wondered if we would really make it to LA. Second, Paul announced that he didn't like freeways. So we would be taking <laughs> the scenic route south, which meant Old Highway 101. Third, he drove a constant 50 miles an hour, saying the truck really couldn't go much faster. I tried to enjoy my view of the passing scenes as we inched toward our destination. <laughs> but I usually fell asleep in moving vehicles of any kind, planes, trains, or ships, and the truck proved no exception. Although I tried to stay awake, excited by the prospect of seeing Becky again, the repetitive hum of the wheels put me right to sleep. I hadn't seen Becky in four years. In Madrid, Spain, we'd attended a high school together. Our families lived in the same apartment building. We sat next to each other on the bus to and from school and joined the same clubs. I spent more time at her place than in my own home, where her southern-born parents treated me kindly, even though I didn't say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, as Becky and her brother did. We shared a bed during sleepovers, gossiping and giggling until the, the night away, and until falling asleep exhausted as the sun came up. I often curled up against her back in bed, seeking the human warmth I so much desired that was sorely missing in my own home. When I woke up in the truck, it was getting dark. I had no idea how far we had come. I asked Paul where we were, but I didn't recognize the name of the neighborhood. He told me he was tired and he didn't like to drive at night, so we would crash with a friend of his. Well, since I couldn't drive, and I had no idea where we were, and no idea how to get where I wanted to go, I had no choice but to go along. Paul drove through some rough-looking neighborhoods, finally parking in front of a seedy apartment building. We got out of the truck, took our small bags with us. He scanned the row of apartment numbers and buzzed one on the top floor. After a short exchange of words through a tinny speaker, 
the metal gate clicked open and we were inside. For as long as it took to climb the five flights of stairs, I felt safer, hearing the iron door shut behind us. The apartment door was ajar. Loud music belched from inside. Paul tentatively pushed the door open, saying, Hello? My eyes widened as I took in the scene. Despite the cold winter night, the heater was off and all the windows were open. Half a dozen very large, bearded, and tattooed men were talking, drinking, and strutting around. They were all naked, except for a large back bath towel wrapped around the waist, held in place by a knife belt or a gun belt. <laughs> the knife belts held knives, and the gun belts held guns. I tried to make myself as small and inconspicuous as possible. I whispered urgently to Paul, where's the bathroom? He pointed down a hallway and I walked to the end as fast as I could without breaking into a run. I shut the door, I turned the small lock, and I sat on the closed toilet lid with both feet up, hugging my knees. I was frightened. A thousand thoughts ran through my mind. Escape? There were no cell phones back then, and even if there were, who would I call? The universal 911 service wasn't even available. I didn't have a phone book to get the number for the local police. Hell, I didn't even know what city I was in. Even if I made it out the front door, where would I go? I had almost no money. And even if I could find a pay phone, I couldn't call Becky at her parents' home. I didn't know the address where I was trapped or how to explain the situation. What would I say? The noise from the main room was getting louder. It seemed the men were now doing shots and beers. They could be one of those dangerous motorcycle gangs known for dealing pot and speed. Fight, flight, or freeze. My best option was to stay put. I hoped the thin door and the cheap lock would keep them out. Maybe they would leave to get food and then I could run away. With my back against the iron claw-footed bathtub, I sat down on the thin bath mat, hugged my duffel bag, and settled in for a long night. Suddenly, a rattling of the bathroom doorknob startled me. I froze, holding my breath. Hey, it's me, Paul whispered. Please, let me in. Nothing doing. I wasn't going to budge. But he kept pleading. Please, I'm afraid, let me in. I did the calculations. Paul wasn't much bigger than me. He had been trustworthy so far. I whispered back, are you alone? He said yes, so I let him in. Paul stumbled through the door, and I quickly shut and locked it again. What's going on, I whispered. My friend doesn't live here anymore, Paul said. I tried to find out where he'd moved to, but these guys were too stoned to be much help. I think we're stuck here for the night. Paul said the big men were engaged in some kind of knife game. I think there's going to be a fight, he said. It was now past midnight, only six more hours to go, and the sun would be up and we could make our getaway. It was so cold on the tile floor that I tried to curl up in a ball on the tiny bath mat. I'm cold too, Paul said. Let me lie against your back to keep you warm. He lay down behind me and wrapped his arm around me, spooning. Even though he was small, I felt safer, protected for the moment from the large men. I awoke to something jabbing me in the back. It was Paul, or rather, Paul's erection. His hands were fumbling around my waist, trying to unzip my jeans. Hey, I said, what are you doing? Shh, said Paul, keep quiet. Well, cut it out, I said, as loud a whisper as I could. I need to get some sleep. He said, okay, okay. Just as I dozed off again, Paul repeated his efforts to engage in sex. As many times as I said no, he backed off, but just as many times he started up again. I couldn't leave the bathroom, my safe place. I didn't have the physical th strength to throw Paul out. I didn't want to make any noise that would attract the attention of the large men. 
In exasperation, still with my back to him, I finally let him have his way. It didn't take long. Satisfied, I said. I assumed my ordeal was over. As soon as it was light, Paul tentatively opened the bathroom door. The loud music was still blaring, but all of the men were asleep or passed out. I followed him as he tiptoed around their bodies, flew down the stairs, and jumped into the old Ford truck. Paul dropped me off at the bus station. No words were exchanged. In Riverside, Becky's family picked me up for the weekend. That night, Becky invited me to sleep with her in her bed, just like old times. Except that it, instead of gossip and giggles, I was frozen in fear, staring at the ceiling. I wanted to feel Becky's warmth like I used to, but now it just seemed wrong. At the end of my visit, Becky bought me a return bus ticket, and on the ride back, I vowed to learn how to drive. I never spoke about the incident on the bathroom floor to her or to anyone. I just put it out of my mind. Becky and I made plans to meet again, but we never saw each other again. At first we telephoned, and then we wrote letters, but ultimately over the years we lost touch. I hadn't thought about that incident again until a couple of months ago when I got an email from Becky's brother saying that she'd entered hospice care in Alabama. Although many years had passed since we'd been in contact, my old feelings for her rushed to the surface. I began to search airline schedules and fares, hoping to visit her while there was still time. As I considered the options, my thoughts wandered back to our high school years. I found an old photograph taken just before we parted ways in Spain. We were at a fancy restaurant in Madrid, all dressed up in our 17-year-old best. A roving photographer took our picture, and we signed each other's prints. I was still trying to piece together a way to get to her hospice in Alabama when I got a second email saying Becky had died. It had only been three days. I was shocked. I felt like she went so quickly. I was so sorry I hadn't been there for her during her illness, especially at the end. I never had the chance to say goodbye or tell her how much I loved her. In reality, though, I'd lost her years ago. I buried my visit to Becky in Riverside in a dark corner of my mind, mixed up with my suppressed anger at that night on the bathroom floor. I'd been angry with Paul, but even angrier with myself. What happened? Who was to blame? I had no words to describe it, no explanation for it. Only one thing was sure. I felt such a deep and abiding shame, I could never reveal my dark secret to anyone. Over time, that shame ate away both at me and at my relationship with Becky. It blotted out all the good memories, and so I turned my back on our friendship. Despite this all happening nearly 50 years ago, for me, it might as well have been yesterday because collateral damage lasts for a long, long time.